Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I'm going to, I want to talk about adaptation and casting choices because apparently there is another controversial set of casting choices, storm in a teacup kind of stuff, because this happens all the time that a popular series, a uh, popular uh, narrative gets adapted and certain fans get annoyed with casting choices because it's not who they had picked or they, they think something different. And we've seen this time and time again, and it's come up recently in relation to Neil Gaiman's adaptation of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. And you go, the clue here is that the guy that wrote it is the guy in charge of the adaptation. Let him tell the story the way that he wants to tell the story. What I, I will never understand why this is an issue. And I will explain why. So if you think back to the Shawshank Redemption, this was an adaptation of a Stephen King story and put on the screen, won all those Oscars. And why are you bringing this up? Because Morgan Freeman plays Red, who was essentially an Irish American in the story. You know, when you're casting an Irish American, you immediately think Morgan Freeman. Why is this not a controversial choice? Because Morgan Freeman was bloody brilliant. Morgan Freeman gave an amazing performance and was the fact that Red was originally Irish a major plot point? Did it affect the narrative in any way? No, it didn't. Morgan Freeman gave an amazing performance. We got to watch it and enjoy it. So what's the big deal? Why wasn't there a huge amount of controversy about this at the time? Because there wasn't a vitriolic, uh, me obsessed fan base who uh, were really annoyed. And yet, this is not the only example of this sort of stuff that we have seen. In Daredevil, the first Daredevil film uh, with Ben Affleck, Jennifer Garner, Colin Farrell, and Michael Clark Duncan. Michael Clark Duncan being cast as the Kingpin. There was enormous outcry at that time. But of course, like in today's society, Twitter, social media, all of these things amplify it. And we're all, a lot of us are still locked in our homes and stuck on computers all day. So we, we hear it more. And news outlets starved of 24-hour news are reporting this as if it's in any way important. But Michael Clark Duncan was cast as the Kingpin. The Kingpin, a white character, and they cast an African-American actor. Oh my God, this is absolutely terrible. Did his race have anything to do with this character? No, it didn't. He was brilliant in that portrayal because he was so physically the kingpin uh, for that version of the story, that version of the character. What was the big deal about changing his race? There wasn't a big deal. It had nothing to do with who the character essentially is. It all had to do with people objecting to a character that was white in the comic book being portrayed by an African-American actor. And you go, it had nothing to do with the actual story. It had nothing to do with the interaction between the two. And it actually added an interesting dimension, although it, it added an unfortunate uh, racial undertone of the black guy being bad and the good guy being white. You know, that was an unfortunate side effect. But um, was it a good portrayal? Yes. Like seeing him there physically as the kingpin, absolutely brilliant. When we saw the um, Netflix adaptation of Daredevil into the TV show with Charlie Cox and Vincent de Onofrio, I may have mispronounced that, um, he was nowhere near as physically present as um, Michael Clark Duncan. Wasn't the, the same portrayal. He gave it a very different uh, style of performance and it really fitted the narrative it, it, it totally different dimension to the story and it was really interesting did his race have anything to do with it no it didn't matter the, the race of that character was unimportant the the important thing was having a really good actor and a really good writing team writing a really good story neil gaiman wrote the sandman neil gaiman an award-winning actor or sorry an award-winning writer He's in control of the story. He's working with the um, the writer's team. We have every confidence that he's going to put the best version of that story on, this, on the screen as possible. 
What does it matter who is being cast as long as the person who knows and understands the characters is the person in control of it? Because it's not about the race of a character. It's not about the gender of a character. It's not about the sexuality of a character unless that is important to who the character is. If that is a defining aspect of them within the narrative. If that is just that's who they were in the story and it doesn't have any bearing, then change all of those things. And even if it is important to the character, as long as the writers are aware that this is an important aspect and find a way to integrate that change, to uh, take account of that change, then it's taken care of. We get a different version of the character, we get a different version of the story. And the thing that blows my mind about all of this, when... Uh, Idris Elba was cast as Heimdall and a whole lot of the comic book fans went mad. Idris Elba, who gave this brilliant, brilliant, gravelly, hard staring with the weird golden eyes performance. And you just go, yeah, it's Idris Elba. This is brilliant. He's a weird as guardian god thing. Like, whatever. Thor, weird as guardian god thing. Like, it, it, it's a comic book. It, in these comic books, there are multiple realities, there are alternate versions, there are alternate realities, there are multiple versions of different characters. Why, if, if it really bugs you that much, think of it solely as, oh, this is happening in alternate universe number 657, and it's a different adaptation, and treat it as a new story. If that's what it takes for you to get over this, then do that. Because ultimately, when it comes down to it, very rarely is the character's race or ethnicity or sexuality or gender or religious background an essential element that has to be portrayed unless part of the story is actually about that. And that's the big caveat. If the story is investigating that particular aspect or if it has an enormous bearing on the story then you have to be very careful when you adapt it that's it care has to be taken you have to pay attention to it and a classic example of this is if you think and i've, I've used this example before the lord of the rings in the fellowship of the ring uh, in the book glorfindel meets Aragorn and the hobbits when Frodo has been wounded, takes Frodo, sticks him on the back of the horse, sends the horse away, Frodo and the horse right away to the, the ford, pursued, exit stage left, pursued by the Nazgul. And Frodo turns around and refuses their temptation, he stands up to them, uh, he's being tempted by the ring, by the, Naz, uh, by the Nazgul, he falls to the ground, he's wounded, the waters rise up and wipe them all away. Excellent. And once he's recovered, everyone at the Council of Elrond is kind of impressed that he managed to do this, that he had the strength of will, the strength of character to do this. When we saw the animated adaptation, they replaced Glorfindel with Legolas. And to be perfectly honest, it made sense. Legolas is going to be in the film and in the story for a lot longer. So why not just introduce him one scene earlier, remove a character that that was basically the major point of them in that story. Yes, Glorfindel is incredibly important to the Legendarium. Yes, Glorfindel is an important character, but not for this particular story. So replacing him with Legolas made no difference. This, the narrative played out exactly the same way. The Peter Jackson adaptation, however, replaced Glorfindel with Arwen. Do I have a problem with that? No. Because again, it's it's another it's just an elf riding up and going get him a horse. The problem I had with it was in order to increase the size of Liv Tyler's role as Arwen. Jackson made the decision to have Arwen throw Frodo basically over the horse and ride off with Frodo like a sack of potatoes, and she's the one who. Uh, refuses the Nazgul, and she's the one that raises the waters, and she's the one that does everything which completely removes Frodo's agency and completely removes the whole point of the scene. So her gender, the fact that we have gender swapped the elf who rescues Frodo, absolutely irrelevant. The thing that was relevant was they changed the narrative. That's, that's 
part of it. Now, if you imagine one of the uh, relationships that's developed in The Lord of the Rings is the friendship between Gimli and Legolas. Now, a modern reading would perhaps put a homoerotic subtext to it. But you could maybe assume that Tolkien had intended it to be these two racial enemies, but coming to respect each other, then coming to camaraderie, uh, camarader coming to love one another platonically, asexually, that it was a deep abiding love, the brothers in arms, that they loved one another, they cared about one another, but it was not sexual, it was not romantic. That had nothing to do with it. It was they found true friendship. Now, if you gender swapped either one of them, you would just have to be careful that you never implied a romantic or sexual relationship because that would change that dynamic. Could you gender swap either one of them? Yeah. It, the fact that they are male is, isn't intrinsic to what they do within the story. But that aspect of their story about their friendship, as long as you were cognizant that a deep abiding love and friendship between them is an important part and you paid attention to that and made sure it never came across as romantic or sexual, then yeah, gender swap one of them. It doesn't change a huge amount about the narrative. Changing Aragorn's gender, on the other hand, would potentially have problems because then you're, are you going to change Arwen's gender so that they can get married at the end and have kids and the whole line of Numenor re-established? Or are you going to have a lesbian relationship and then Aragorn is the new, the king is returned at the return of the king and, and the line ends because uh, primogenitor, they don't have any kids, uh, you know, it's, it's two women changing Aragorn's gender, you would have to work that out. Is it, uh, you can never do it? No, yeah, of course you could do it if that's what you wanted to do. But you have to work these things out. It, it's not a case of you could never do it. As long as you pay attention to it, as long as you understand what the role and function and the narrative consequences are, you can change all sorts of things. You could change the entirety of Gondor to become Wakanda. You could take the entire cast of Black Panthers Wakanda, stick them in Gondor, change Boromir and Faramir to Wakandan royalty, put them all in the Gondorian armor, and it would be absolutely fine because it's not changing anything intrinsically about the nation of Gondor because the nation of Gondor is a fictional race and it doesn't matter. It's not like you're taking the ethnic origins of, say, the Irish and going, yeah, they were all of these different types. You go, well, there was a certain cast to the Irish at a certain point. And if you're going back in time, you might want to pay attention to that. Was there some racial and ethnic diversity? More than likely because the Irish used to take slaves from everywhere. So, you know, you could work that in, but predominantly you would have a certain cast and mean to the characters. But the people of Gondor, as long as you replaced basically all of them and you, you did that, it wouldn't have a narrative impact. So then we get to the question of like, well, why would you want to change things if, if that isn't an issue in the story, if it's not in the, the original narrative? Number one, uh, it's the modern day. And let's face it, adapting something like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings that was uh, written and, and published a long time ago. Uh, in the 1950s, like he wrote it long before then, but in the 1950s, he had a very uh, specific outlook and a very specific upbringing, upbringing, and he was telling a specific type of story. Um, but we live in a multicultural, multiracial, much broader, bigger, wider, interconnected world. So why not reflect that in our stories? Why limit ourselves to, oh, well, this was how it was in the past and therefore we must stick to the past, particularly with something that, like fantasy or science fiction or horror, where we can change things. Dragons exist. Why can't we have different colored skin? It, it's not a big deal. The second thing is all of these things being adapted, put on the big screen, put on the little screen, put on streaming services. These are commercial properties. And if you want to reach the greatest audience, include the greatest audience, include things that are going to bring audiences that have 
not been catered to, not been encouraged. Bring them in because if you're the financial backer of this commercial product, wider audience means you make more money. So even if you don't care about representation, even if you don't care about diversity, even if you don't care about any of those things, it will make more money because you're appealing to a broader audience. If you care about having interesting stories and new takes on stories, because let's face it, I, I have a copy of The Sandman sitting on my shelves. It's great. I've read it. It's fantastic. This is a new adaptation. I don't want just The Sandman put on screen because I already have it. I don't need to see it on screen. I want to see a live action adaptation. I want to see something different. They are different media. Therefore, there's stuff that they can do in live action that they couldn't do on the page. There's stuff that they can do on the page that would be very difficult to replicate in live action. So it's going to be really interesting to see a new take on a story, changing things around, playing with things, trying to generate new narrative beats within the story instead of just going, this is exactly how it was in the book. This is exactly how it, you go, well, what's the point then? I've already read it. Why would I want to watch it if it's going to be exactly the same? So, you know, that's another reason why you might want to shake things up, why you might want to change things. And it still basically comes down to the fact that, you know what? It doesn't make a difference as long as it's a good story, as long as it's a good performance, as long as all of these things are taken into account and the person writing the story and in control of all of this is going, yeah, this is exactly how I want to tell my story. We trust we have to trust authors, we have to trust writers, we have to trust these creative people to try to, to, to do the best that they can, to tell the best story that they can. And prejudging it because it doesn't match what was on a comic book page for something published 30 years ago. Aren't there other more important things to get worried about? Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.